Hello and welcome back to An Old Man Watches, where today I will be talking about the 1950 romantic comedy crime caper film, Borderline. Uh, in this film, LAPD operative Madeline Haley is sent to Mexico to infiltrate the narcotic smuggling operation of gangster Pete Ritchie. Now, I'm pretty sure the LAPD has no jurisdiction in Mexico, but let's not let troublesome details like that get in the way. Uh, Madeline has enough to worry about already, as she immediately walks into a feud between Richie and another gangster. Said rifle gangster's right-hand man, Johnny Macklin, steals a shipment of Richie's narcotics and also kidnaps Madeline in the process, dragging her along with him as he heads to the US border. Madeline, smartly, decides to play along with Macklin. After all, when they get to the border, she can bring the authorities down on him then. Of course, getting to the United States isn't going to be easy. The Mexican police don't know who she is, and while that could get sorted out, given some time, revealing her identity before the border would mean losing the chance to bust the US end of the smuggling ring. To make matters worse, Richie is gunning for payback, and I do mean gunning. So, her life is already pretty complicated. She certainly doesn't need anything else to make it even more so. Which is why it's so annoying to her that Johnny Macklin is handsome, smart, and seems like a pretty good guy, apart from that whole being a gangster thing. The kind of guy, in other words, that she could fall for if it wasn't for the fact that he was a crook. How in the world could such a conundrum ever be resolved? You've probably already guessed. And, you know, that's fair enough. It's a pretty easy thing to guess, because this film is a light and breezy crime caper, and it's not the kind of film to hold its cards too close to its chest. This more relaxed uh, narrative style seems to have met with some disdain from contemporary critics on its release, at least some of whom opined that it wavered between seriousness and farce and is successful at neither. I do wonder if those critics perhaps came in with preconceived expectations that a crime film must either be an out-and-out -out comedy or a gritty noir thriller and struggled to adjust to a movie that had elements of both, much like a, a much earlier The Whole Nine Yards kind of thing. Uh, for myself, I came into the movie with only one preconceived conception, uh, that it would be bad. Uh, after all, it was part of a 10-pack of DVDs that I bought entirely because it included the original 1932 version of Scarface, and the other films that I'd seen from the pack had varied between, well, okay, not entirely terrible, and actually pretty terrible. So this movie proved a pleasant surprise. It's not a great film, let's be clear, but I found it solidly watchable, uh, and I had a pretty good time with it. And this was at least partly a result of the cast, who are certainly a cut above the average for the movies that were part of this collection. Uh, Madeline Haley is played by Claire Trevor, who won an Academy Award for Key Largo. Uh, she's cast uh, against type here. She was best known for her bad girl roles. So it's quite unusual to see her playing uh, an LAPD operative, or albeit one who has to pretend to be a bad girl. But she settles into the role quite comfortably and plays well of Fred McMurray in the role of Johnny Macklin. Uh, McMurray was perhaps best known today for the long-running TV show My Three Sons, but in the early to mid-40s he was the highest paid leading man in Hollywood uh, and took the lead in numerous movies including the noir classic Double Indemnity. Uh, he's another actor who was often typecast, in his case, as a nice guy. Uh, and McMurray, however, felt that he did his best work when he was a cast against that type, which he is here, at least on the surface of things. So Trevor and McMurray work well together as the core duo, and they're ably matched by Raymond Burr. Again, an actor best known these days for his TV work, Perry Mason, a role McMurray actually turned down. Uh, Burr is the only one of the three not cast against type. Uh, in the late 40s and early 50s, he was something of an icon in crime noir films for his portrayal of memorable antagonists. Uh, and Burr lives up to that reputation here, giving a convincingly menacing performance as gangster Pete Ritchie. So, the on-screen talent, they're good. And they're matched uh, behind the camera by veteran director William A. Zeiter, who uh, first picked up the megaphone way back in the silent era. Uh, Zeiter was apparently not the easiest of directors to work with, uh, famously feuding with Lou Costello on the set of Little Giant, but he knew the job well and worked extensively and effectively on dozens of movies with many big-name stars, such as the Marx Brothers, Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire, Henry Fonda and John Wayne. Now, I didn't find any information suggesting that Borderline became one of the cases where Zeiter clashed with his cast, but it did have some interesting behind-the-scenes elements. It was the first production of Borderline Pictures, a company co-formed by Zeiter, McMurray, and producer Milton Bren, in order to make this movie. 
uh, and the three men clearly had considerable passion and or confidence in the project, uh, as all of them, as well as Claire Trevor, deferred their salaries for the production. Uh, this is a mechanism whereby actors and possibly crew agree to be paid at a later date when certain conditions are met. Uh, no doubt there's some, sometimes an incentive included in such arrangements. Well, we could pay you X now or you could get more than X later. Uh, but it's a common practice just in general in independent filmmaking where productions are often cash poor and can only afford to pay their cast and crew after the movie is already out there and has been sold. Big stars like this doing it, however, is more notable and unusual, and yeah, suggests that this was something of a passion project for the men and women involved. So, this film coaxed some genuine laughs from me while I was watching it. There's some great banter between Madeline and Johnny as the two verbally spar throughout most of their journey to the border. Um, it is, of course, a more than 70-year-old film, so prepare for some rather dated men versus women stuff to be trotted out. Um, and it's conspicuous that uh, all of these characters in Mexico are, you know, North European in heritage. Uh, you know, there's not a lot of, you know, obviously Hispanic or uh, native major characters. Uh, overall, though, uh, there's not enough of that kind of thing to detract from my enjoyment of the movie. I can manage to tune out you know, some amount of racism and gender stereotyping in such older productions, uh, and this film didn't exceed that threshold. Your threshold, obviously, may be different. But yeah, if you're in the mood for a fairly light crime romp with some chuckles along the way, this breezy offering might well fit the bill, and it's easy enough to watch as the film has fallen into the public domain, uh, which is probably how it ended up in the 10-pack films, uh, films that I bought. Uh, you can legally watch this online at the Internet Archive, uh, which is probably a better bet than watching it on a cheapy DVD, to be honest. There's apparently at least one DVD version of the movie out there that's accidentally cut out a scene that reveals one of the movie's key plot points, uh, resulting in the characters later knowing information that they shouldn't because the scene isn't there for them to learn it. But yeah, overall, I thought this was pretty good. Nice surprise. Next time. 1970s sci-fi nihilism in the high concept but low outcomes offering Idaho transfer. But that's next time. Until then, thanks for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it, and if you've seen today's movie, let me know what you thought of it.